Hmm. Hey, how's it going? So we have another version of the thing. Yeah. And we just added on. Uh, Joe sent Joe sent me one this morning. Final slides to replace zero zero. Is that the one you're talking about? Okay. Hi, how are you? Good. Sorry, I don't have the slides for Juan Carlos, so I'm rushing to get them. What is that? Okay, sure. Yes. You mentioned once again that you were asking in the No, I don't think so. Yeah, it's not ready yet. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to HRPC. Um, we're about five minutes late, but that's 
it's the first session of the day. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it is it is just me today. I'm Mallory Nodal. I'm, I'm with Article 19. Um, but my co-chair, Avri Doria, is on Meet Echo. And I think we're all ready. I'm just checking. Yeah, I think our, our remote presenters are all here. Um, we have our slides loaded and the blue sheets are going around. Um, so yeah, you'll see we have um, a nice breezy agenda up. First, we're going to have a talk um, by Juan Carlos de Martin for the first 30 minutes. Um, I'll let him introduce himself and, and his talk. And then we'll discuss two um, drafts that are adopted by the research already. One is on uh, draft association. So um, I believe uh, Joe Hall and Stefan Kertrue are going to be representing on that. Um, and then draft political will be um, presented and discussed by um, Neil Sonova remotely. And, and then we have also a draft that has been discussed in this group a few times now on the intersection of protocols and feminism. It's not yet adopted by the research group, but we do have some updates on that. Um, and then lastly, on the scheduled portion of the agenda, we're going to discuss um, the guidelines draft, which is also a research group draft um, that sort of builds on our RFC 8280 um, and allows people to sort of engage, evaluate, review um, IETF work um, from the perspective of, of human rights. And so that item and that draft are coupled with small presentations um, by people who've been doing reviews in IETF to understand how that's working out, um, where that draft is, um, and any other things related to doing those reviews. And then we have AOB. So if anybody has something to add at AOB, it'd be good to know sooner rather than later so we can make sure we have enough time for it. So if you have something that you've been dying to put on the agenda, could you let me know? Let me know now, AKA we are doing some agenda review. Anyone? Okay. Well, we'll see at the end <laughs> if you have something that pops up. Um, okay, so the note well. Um, it is only Tuesday, so maybe you haven't seen it, and the text is really tiny, so um, you might actually have to bring that up on your machine if you need to read the note well. Um, just a review of this uh, research group for people who've not been here before. Um, we were chartered in the IRTF as a research group to look at the, um, how protocols can strengthen or be a detriment to human rights um, and human rights being very specifically defined as a standard, in fact, for the, by the UN um, DR, um, DHR and the ICCPR. Um, so the, the tasks that we've identified under that charter are to look at the relationship um, between protocols and human rights, but specifically we have in our charter to focus on um, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. And as well, we um, are looking at uh, the guidelines to protect the internet as a human rights enabling environment uh, for future uh, protocol development. So it's, we were inspired by RFC 6973, um, and that is sort of what we have now with um, RFC 8280 which I will get to as part of the history. Um, and yeah, generally speaking, to, to talk about human rights in this setting um, and to increase awareness and, and uh, raise the capacity to discuss these complicated social issues in the context of um, an engineering and technical space. So we, um, the, the research group is seeking to, of course, put together internet drafts. Um, that the focus on research. We're also interested in going beyond as well to look at the potential to write policy and academic papers um, that relate to this work to, um, to take it outside of this space. There in the past have been some even multimedia expressions of this. There's a film um, called The Internet of Rights, I believe. Um, you can look, you can view that at the um, research group's website. Um, and as well, there's been some in the past data analysis, which I think we'll continue to have to do to really look at what are the dynamics in the IETF and how we can learn something from that. And of course, we're reviewing um, protocols as well. So yeah, these are the mil milestones, if you will. Um, so we have the proposal, um, the chartering, the film, and 
uh, RFC 8280. Those are the main highlights. We're going to have more of those <laughs> as time goes on. And right now we have um, three active drafts, which we're going to talk about today. First, we're talking about association and politics, the first and third one on this slide. And then at the end, we're talking about the guidelines draft. We've had other um, internet drafts in the past, but those are expired as far as I know. So that is where we're at. That is the history of HRPC. Um, we are now moving into um, the presentation by Juan Carlos to Martin. So I will give some time for that to get set up and load the slides. Can you hear me? Yes, we can Wonderful. hear you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Chair. Um, I'm Juan Carlos de Martin, and uh, I'm speaking from Turin, Northwestern Italy. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this group, which I've been following uh, through the mailing list. Uh, but it was the first time that I actually interact with, with all of you. I was supposed to be there in person. Unfortunately, for family reason, I couldn't travel to Montreal. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you for this opportunity to present remotely. Just a few words about me. I'm a professor of computer engineering at the Polytechnic of Turin. And uh, for the past 15 years, I've been working, uh, studying several uh, topics uh, regarding um, internet and society with uh, law professors, uh, economists, uh, philosophers, etc. Uh, usually in the within the context of the Nexus Center for Internet and Society, which I founded, also in the context of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Uh, what I would like to share with you uh, today is um, our work about uh, something we called ethically and socially aware data labels. Uh, next slide, please. Could you, okay, thank you. Uh, this, what I'm uh, presenting is a, is a uh, summary of what you will find uh, um, a bit more in detail in a publication. My co-authors are Elena Beretta, Antonio Vetro, and Bruno Lepri, and the publication is available both on the Springer website and also as open access on the Nexa Center website, and you can find the URL over there. Next slide, please. Can you see me? Yeah, there's just a bit of a delay usually with okay. the slides. Is it turning Yes, and also, email? can you see the, um, I should also send my own video, but probably it's not showing. Let's try again. Not that it's necessary to see my face, but maybe it would be. Okay, I'll, I'll proceed with the slides. Um, okay, let me disable the video according to the instructions I'm receiving through the chat. Okay, um, now the starting point is that we all know the crucial role of data for the design and development, certainly of machine learning algorithms, but more generally of recommendation systems and many digital systems. Just to, next slide please, just to uh, show um, a quotation among many. Uh, this is taken from the very well-known book by Katie O'Neill, Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, example based on one of the main chapters of the book based on, on the admissions uh, by American universities. Obviously, if we had trained, do training on the basis of past data from the 1960s or 70s, uh, we would have, of course, uh, a recommendation system or our enrollment system and that would uh, uh, show the same biases of the data sets collected uh, regarding those decades. Next slide, please. Um, now, to avoid discrimination and other unintended negative effects, uh, we will focus on unintended negative effects, of course. Uh, care is needed at all stages of the design and development process of a machine learning system, of a recommendation system, etc. I will show you in a second uh, which stages we're focusing on. Next slide, please. Uh, we're focusing at the beginning, uh, so upstream, 
the data is produced, uh, is um, collected. Afterwards, we have a data set, and this data set is available for use, maybe by organizations and people that have nothing to do with the organization that collected the data. So we have these data sets that are coming from somewhere. Maybe we don't have any personal connection or institutional connection with the collectors, so that we just have the data. And this data is used as the primary input to develop, uh, for instance, a recommendation system. And uh, therefore, this is where we're focusing. Next slide. So the key idea, which is, by the way, not original, other people are working also in the same direction. We are just contributing this effort, is to support computer scientists using data sets by means of easy to understand labels, so, or more broadly, in our case, easy to understand the approach to better understand the implications of the data sets they're going to use. Next slide, please. Uh, more specifically, uh, now there is a, a fairly large body of uh, research um, showing that certain data characteristics uh, uh, may lead, uh, sometimes in ways that are not completely self-evident, uh, to discriminatory decisions, and therefore, it is important to identify those data characteristics and to show the potential risk of those data characteristics if not understood in their full implications. Next slide, please. So what we're, we're focusing between step one and step two, so the data sets, as I mentioned, have been collected, has traveled who knows where, now is in the hands of a computer scientist who wants to use the data set. Right at that moment, we would like to provide a framework to properly use those data sets. Next slide, Next, uh, slide please. Um, so um, we want to label data sets. So the ultimate, ultimate end is a, is a sort of labels that are easy to understand, uh, quick uh, to, um, to comprehend. Um, showing that certain data characteristics, for instance, um, uneven distribution in gender balance, uh, collinearity of attributes, uh, uh, etc. We will, I will show you examples in the following slides, uh, that represent a risk of discrimination is if used in decision making. Now, I want to stress the word risk in the sense that uh, we are not sure, we are just showing that there are potential problems with the data set, but Maybe there is no problem at all because maybe the specific application and the specific uh, um, data set actually is perfectly fine the way it is. But we want to raise a flag saying, okay, are you aware of that? And if the computer scientist says, yes, I'm aware of that and that's perfectly fine for my application, then it can go on. Next slide. So the, the, uh, uh, the focus and the objective is to be useful to software engineers uh, in order to make them more aware of the potential risk. And so if they, as we all hope, uh, want to do so, to be able to use the data set in a more ethical and socially aware manner. In addition, uh, this uh, approach and these labels could be used by third parties uh, to do some sort of independent verification. We can also imagine a situation where um, the data set has been produced, has been, has been used, uh, and then there is a potential third party, which would be, could be a public authority or could be a certificator of some sort uh, who wants to look in the process uh, and this approach uh, can help the certificator to more quickly do its job. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is with no claim of originality. There are at least two other initiatives we're aware of uh, uh, that work in the same direction. One, one is the Data Set Nutrition Label Project, which is a joint project between the Media Lab at MIT and the Berkman Klein um, Center at Harvard. And another uh, project that is similar is Data Sheets for Data Sets by Gabriel and other authors. Next slide, please. Now, what uh, in our approach, in our proposed approach, we have three branches, three main uh, building blocks, and I will show what they are in a second. Next slide, please. 
Uh, first of all, we're going to look about uh, disproportionate tests. So data sets that have features that are disproportionate. Next slide, please. Secondly, we're going to look at the features of the data set that they are correlated uh, or in the extreme case, collinear. So essentially a linear combination of other features in the data set. So th th we have to warn users, uh, look, it's a different feature in the data set, but actually it can be very easily predicted uh, uh, by other features present already present in the data set. Next slide. And third point, uh, um, which has been introduced by one of the co-authors who is a software engineer, is about data quality. Uh, and now uh, it's um, uh, a specific topic which I'm not uh, completely familiar, which is data quality. This co-author, which is Antonio Vetro, who is Antonio Vetro, um, explained us that there is within the International Standards Organization, there are two standards regarding um, the, assess the qualitative and quantitative assessment uh, of data. And therefore, he introduced this third branch, uh, third, third building block uh, to assess uh, data sets, which is data quality in this specific sense uh, of uh, ISO uh, standards, and which are in, uh, articulated into uh, five quality dimensions, which are accuracy, completeness, consistency, credibility, and correctness. Next slide, please. Now, um, having brought together these three um, building blocks, so we wanted to test them to do an experiment to do an exercise uh, with a specific uh, data set, uh, well known uh, in the studies uh, of this, uh, in this kind of problems. Next slide, please. It's uh, the data set called credit, credit core default. Um, there is information in this data set on default payments of credit cards. Uh, in Taiwan from April to September 2005. And in these data sets, you find demographic factors uh, like the age of the person, credit data information, history of payment, and bill statements of credit card clients. So there is a various number of, uh, of features, and some of them are critical in the sense that I mentioned before. Next slide, please. Um, for instance, the data set uh, do not con does not contain uh, the protected attributes race, ethnicity, but contains, which we know, of course, it's a very sensitive uh, uh, feature, but contains other personal information that can be used uh, in a discriminatory way if applied to assess credit worthiness, uh, uh, for instance, gender or level of education. So let's dig a little deeper and see what we found looking at this data set. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at the first one, disproportionateness. Please, next slide. For instance, very simple factor, age. We see that this is a, a histogram of age, very easy to, um, to plot this uh, feature. We see that there is a high prevalence of uh, young people between the age of 25 uh, and 40. Um, now, the objective of showing the user of the data set this information is just to no, is not to tell them there's something wrong with this. We don't know if there's something wrong. We're just saying, this is the age profile. Make sure, implicitly we're saying, make sure that whatever you want to do with this data set, uh, you're okay with this age profile. Is it representative of the people in Taiwan? Is it representative of credit card owners in Taiwan? Is it uh, okay for your application? So we're just uh, making clear that this is the profile and it may be okay or maybe not. Next slide, please. Now, again, looking at features that we know can have potential implications for discrimination, for instance, we're saying 60% of the, of the people in this database are women. Uh, almost half of them attended college and we have a more, more or less an half and half split between single people and married people. Again, uh, we know that all these features, level of education, gender, and uh, marital status, uh, can have implications, can be potentially discriminatory if not used uh, properly. And so we are uh, showing the user of data set, this is the way it is in this data set, don't use it blindly. Because uh, if you use it blindly, thinking it is a, is a representative of the general population, maybe 
you're going to produce uh, unintended consequences in your system. Next slide, please. Uh, correlation and collinearity. Next slide. Now, looking at the features within the data set, we found um, uh, very significant correlations between uh, the um, condition of payment default, so somebody who didn't pay the credit card bills, and their level of education, so uh, their gender and their marital status. Again, these three, these correlations are not surprising uh, because, for instance, if you look at the level of education, you see that uh, the higher the level of education, the lower is the likelihood of a payment default, which is uh, intuitive, con considering all other, whatever, everything we know about uh, what is correlated with a high level of education. But uh, we're making it uh, straightforward, easy to understand for the data set user saying, uh, if you're looking, beware. If you're, for instance, using the marital status or the level of education, and, and you're using it, using it without being aware that it's uh, highly correlated in one way or, other, or another with the payment default, uh, beware because you might get something that you actually is not what you wanted. Next slide, please. Finally, data quality. I will only mention that applying the two uh, ISO standards that I mentioned before, actually you can only apply two of the five attributes, accuracy and completeness, which are actually quite good for this specific data set. Next slide, please. I conclude. Uh, so this approach, which is, as you understood, it's a, uh, is a proposal of how to address data sets and then produce actually graphically appealing uh, labels like the two other projects that I mentioned are working on could help uh, data sets user to be more aware of the potential biases and problems of the data set before using them. So the moment they acquire this data set, they are helped, they are supported in understanding the implication, at least some of them, because of course some implications are difficult to, to assess ex ante, but at least some of them, therefore reducing the risk of downstream unintended problems also for human rights. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, are there going to be questions? People want to queue? Is uh, labeling data in this way not potentially likely to make it even easier to discriminate? And if you say, oh, we found like 15 collinearities between LGBTQ people and, I don't know, credit card defaults, you could then apply that to learn from other data and reveal perhaps private information about people through labeling this data in this uh, way? That's, that's why I used uh, so many times the, um, the adjective unintended, because we are assuming that the data users is in good faith, and so we're helping a good faith data user. Um, if it's not in good faith, so the, if the intention is actually to discriminate, uh, sure, this approach could be helpful, but if it's in bad faith, uh, they could do what we're doing anyway, and so we would they would reach the same result uh, with a little more effort. The sorry, Jonathan Hoyland, I didn't say my name before. Um, make, making it easier for people to do bad things tends to make people do more bad things. Oh, oh well. <laughs> uh, actually, a warning sign saying that uh, be careful, this could lead to bad consequences. Uh, I don't see it as uh, conducive to doing bad things. I cannot. Um, I mean, otherwise, the the other alternative is just obscurity. So, trying to reach security by making things uh, difficult to understand. For example making sure that you publish data sets with enough noise to break this collinearity. And I'm sure I don't understand uh, if there is a collinearity adding the noise. Uh... Ah. Adding the noise could mask the collinearity by making, by breaking the correlation effectively. Uh, well, if the noise is white, it's so easy to filter out and find out the collinearity anyway, just out of the top of my head. Not so easy. Uh, 
different question. My name is Joe Hall from CDT. Uh, in the U.S., DARPA, DARPA is right. the Defense Advanced Research Project. They have a version of Android they've been working on for a, a long time now, four or five years. It's called Privacy Enhanced Android, and it does some of this tagging, especially in the developer level, like developers using this, as far as I understand it, and I don't understand it very well, developers using this kind of a framework can sort of talk about intentions and pre-label certain kinds of sensor data and stuff like that. I'm wondering if you've thought about sort of bringing this down to that kind of level, maybe modifying this privacy enhanced Android to also not just be about privacy, but the things mm -hmm. you're talking about, sort of a richer form of intentional labeling of flows and in, in objects and stuff. No, thank you. This is a very good suggestion. We will look into that. Thank you. Anyone um, in the queue remotely? Doesn't look like it. Thank you so thank much, you. Carlos. Thank you, Mallory. I really thank appreciate you. your Thank you all. Yes. Take care. Take care. Okay, um, so, yeah, Joe and Stefan, we're going to talk about draft association. I think so. Let's check. Um, you have 15 minutes, correct? All right, let's do this. Um, so um, Stefan, are here, Stefan and I are here to talk about draft association. We haven't modified the document at all, which for some of you might be like, wait, that was your whole job. But we wanted to put forward some very specific deep changes that might deserve some discussion and then we'll take it to the list and then actually modify the document within about a month, maybe a little longer. Um, do you wanna do your, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm Stefan Kutsur. I'm at York University, soon to be moving at Invest in Maya. So I'm trying to contribute to this draft, but I'm also a communication scholar as part of my research, trying to understand uh, what's going on in IETF and uh, like how people discuss about values in ethics. So if you have question about my research, uh, please come to me after. So put shortly, he's studying us. You're now made aware of that. <laughs> um, Deal with it, I guess. I guess. Uh, cheers. Next, next slide. Uh, just to give you a quick little uh, background, draft association is one of the specific rights that flows from 8280, specific to association assembly. We took the the helm of this after Niels and Gazella handed it off. Um, to us, it feels like it's maybe 75% done. And apologies if I'm talking too quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Um, and what we want to do is actually run through some of the bigger thoughts we had right now. So uh, just a recap of the draft for those who didn't read it. So the, the research question, it's centered about a research question. It, the research question is how does the architecture of the internet enable and or inhibit the right to freedom of assembly and association? The methodology that is stated in the draft uh, is to test the casual relationship, uh, a formulation we, which uh, we will come back to it. Um, so basically, how protocol calls uh, the capacity to associate or assembly through a case selection. Uh, there's basically seven protocol cases uh, that are addressed in the draft. So you have the table of content here, and you have like cases of uh, like conversing cases, peer-to-peer -peer networks and system, and grouping together here. So mailing lists, um, multi-party video conferencing, internet release chat, peer-to-peer -peer system, version control, DNS, and autonomous system, and how each of these uh, case uh, can have potential to, uh, um, yeah, to, uh, to facilitate or constrain association and assembly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the first big question we have is this draft talks about causality. I'm a physicist. Um, I also, Oh, do you want to do this? Yeah, but okay, you present the case after. Well, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, uh, causality. 
Yeah, we had a question because the methodology is based like um, the goal is to establish a causality. So there was this, some discussions like in the mailing list by different people who brought this. Um, like uh, it's a strong objective causality to establish like our protocol calls association and something we think the draft of uh, the draft or like 8280 actually there was no mention of causality. Um, also, like the idea that technology is causing stuff has been a bit more uh, nuanced uh, through studies, for instance, in STS and communication. Uh, draft feminism, for instance, they talk about how they may impact, which is a bit less ambitious. Um, and we don't see uh, causality as a major element. Uh, yeah, so we would like to drop like the idea of causality and maybe replace it by something a bit more nuanced, but at the same time, in a way uh, to show that the protocols can have uh, an impact, but uh, although there are other dimensions and the ways also to circumvent uh, these things, but there's a relation, but maybe, maybe not causal. So that's a question, maybe uh, you can uh, answer about this after, or uh, in the hallways, uh, in the, yeah, after the. Uh, and then the second one, do it. Do it. There you go. Thank you. It's just broken. Thank you, ma'am. You can have. <laughs> um, second one is uh, the the, cho the 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 um, cases that are chosen. Right? There's ones that are about communication, the con the conversing one. There's ones about object or file transfer, sharing stuff. That's peer to peer versioning. Um, then there's stuff about identity, DNS, autonomous systems. But it strikes us that there's other things, and maybe these were left out, and we just couldn't find. A record of that. For example, um, app stores can propose pretty significant uh, uh, restrictions on the ability to associate by removing apps that billions of people use. Maybe that's not an IETF thing. Maybe that's not something that we need to care about because that's not about protocols. Um, otherwise, you know, think about things like SMS, right? That's, I don't know if that's an IETF protocol. I don't think so. I think that might be ITU, something else. What, I don't even know. Um, but these things, you know, like the, ver the difference between SMS and more modern kinds of messaging systems, they do have impacts on assembly. I'm not sure if, if we want to talk about that in this draft or what. We'll, we'll, we'll have a more fulsome discussion on the list. But And, for example, we talk about all these proprietary non-interoperable um, uh, uh, messaging systems by name, but we don't talk about Signal, which is maybe one of the biggest um, proprietary non-interoperable systems. I mean, it's, 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 I guess I can't say proprietary because it's, it's free software, but still, you can't interoperate with it. Good luck. Um, and then we were wondering if there are, if there are sort of longitudinal cases we can describe that might help folks. For example, Turkey is a really interesting case where the government used DNS blocking, and then you may have seen pictures of, and you may have seen me present pictures of this, of people spray painting 8.8.8, .8 right? One to one to one now or whatever, um, but then what happened was when the government realized that their orders to ISPs were not being as effective, it went to a higher level of of, of an effect on their associational rights. So they started doing internal adversarial BGP route announcements for certain kinds of things like Twitter, right? And in those cases, you know that kind of a of an interplay, that kind of a of a longitudinal disruption on freedoms of association and assembly specifically in those cases. That might be a good thing to, to include in this. There are other things like um, Molly Souter has a great book about distributed denial services as a legitimate form of protest that, you know, in the digital world, we haven't created the sidewalks that people use in the physical world to be able to protest. Um, so that we have to do these things like DDoS if we want to be activists and disrupt things. Um, there's just no other alternative. And then um, I forgot the gentleman's name, but this morning we talked about the relationship. Leonardo? Leandro. Um, we're talking about the relationships between um, small, independent, nonprofit providers of things like email and the large, huge email systems like Gmail and Facebook and stuff like that, and how it can be extremely hard to get them to accept your email. And then when they don't, it's very hard to figure out exactly why they didn't accept your email. And that obviously is going to pose some restrictions on association. Oh, 
Um, yeah, uh, ju I wanted to add. So just from my understanding, maybe Leandro could take the mic after this, but the idea, the last one might be more about like spamming protocols. So let's say you uh, use like a rise up email, you send it to Gmail and Gmail consider it's a spam. So this might uh, cut off the capacity to assembly uh, between activists. Uh, so that's, that might be a, a, a use case. Uh, the section we put at the last is, is like, should we, because the, 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 um, the draft is centered much uh, around technologies, but we were wondering if we should start with like um, case, like good examples on our uh, social examples, how it was made, and then go on with the specific uh, case of existing technologies. So we open up this as a question. The last, next slide. Get this on the list. Yeah. Um, the, another uh, question, uh, association on property platforms. Um, we felt that the draft is implicitly critical of large proprietary and uninterrupted, and sorry, I, this word I have, this word, platforms, uh, especially search, such as major social uh, media platforms. So it's not uh, very explicit about this, but there are some sentences, especially at the end, they say uh, basically uh, open, an open a platform or open protocol will favor more association uh, than a pro proprietary platform. On the other hand, we cannot deny that social media like Facebook and Twitter, they, they are a helpful platform for association. So we know, uh, like, uh, we know ma many activists, we, we put Twitter revolution uh, between codes, but uh, it has been criticized, but it's been used by many social movements as a way to associate. Uh, so uh, I think we need to take this into account. Uh, on the other hand, actually the problem might be that uh, Facebook um, as a, uh, or social media, they has like a, 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 like a lot of uh, power by like um, dissociating people, okay? Without, uh, it's not like, it's not a, regulated as it, as it is like uh, in, a, in, in the public space, okay? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, at the end it's, it's talk about a forced association. So um, social media is talking about uh, forcing the association of people, but uh, we were wondering if we could talk about freedom of dissociation, let's say, can we dissociate them ourselves uh, from social media? So it might be another way to, to frame the discussion. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, uh, the last question is more about HRPC work. It's something I thought uh, this morning. So maybe we could think about with our audience. So uh, we have the idea that uh, we want to convince or to to talk with engineers, but uh, these documents, uh, they also attract social activists and social science academics who get interested by ITF and may later influence it. So, uh, in all the writing this, we might think as like, who are we talking? Are we talking only to the folks in IETF or are we talking to uh, other people also through this documentation? So it's not specific to this, but it might be a, a general question for HRPC. Next slide. This is our last slide, sorry. Um, so there's a, a number of not minor ch changes we wanted to mention during our presentation. Um, after each case, there's sort of this dash, li dash list of 80 to 80 considerations um, it's kind of mysterious where that comes from. I mean, you can point to 8280, but we're going to do some things that basically clean that up to add sentences and context and, you know, make it less of a list and more of a, of a narrative or something that, that isn't as mysterious to the readers. Um, we also, you know, right now the document isn't very clear on how these cases were chosen. It uses some some words like these are, you know, typicality and a parad paradigmatic nature of the cases. Um, but we're gonna find ways to talk about the cases we talk about so where it, it makes a little more uh, coherent sense across all the cases. And it's gonna include maybe including new ones, maybe dropping some of the ones we have now. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll um, propose this on the list and, and have either pull requests or, or text uh, changes that you guys can look at. Finally, there's a section in section seven that talks about legal limitations that you know, only lawful limitations on rights are allowed. And, and yeah, that's true of governments that have signed human rights treaties and feel free to, to take issue with this. 
but it doesn't apply to businesses. And so as, as sort of a half of lawyer, what I want to do with this section is take it and, and one, make it not as normative. You know, it, this really needs to be a descriptive document, I think, right, unless I totally missed what we're doing here. Um, but then sort of talk about, change it less talking about grounded in treaties, well, grounded in treaties for governments, but then talk about uh, business social responsibility is the thing that's a hook for why businesses care about human rights in many cases. Um, and that's it. Sorry to be so long. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, please, let's queue up. You guys have posed a lot of really important questions, I think, and it would be great to, yes, for sure, discuss this on the list, but if there are thoughts, I have a whole list. I don't want to just sit here and talk with the three of us. So if <laughs> okay, great, Niels is here. Go ahead, Niels. Do you hear me? Hello. Hi, this is great. Thanks, uh, Joe and Stefan, so much uh, uh, for doing this terrific work on this, which was much needed, and uh, I'm highly indebted. And again, happy to uh, help where I can. Uh, uh, some clarifications. App stores and platforms we tried to keep outside of the draft because it was outside of the remit of the IETF, IR, IRTF. And we tried to, to catch that with the sentence architecture in the, uh, in the research question by trying to limit uh, the scope of it a bit. Going beyond that might make the work a bit unwieldy. Um, Another point is that in your discussions, we talked about the book by Molly Sauter. We also had uh, 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 Molly Sauter uh, uh, respond to the list. And uh, so we discussed there if, whether uh, DDoS could be a positive freedom of expression. And that discussion then ended, which can, of course, be in the, uh, found in the archives. But it was an extensive discussion that an attack is an attack is an attack is an attack. And uh, 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 and then we uh, we achieve, achieved actually a research group consensus on that. So I'm not sure whether you would really want to go down that rabbit hole at least before having a look at that uh, 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 at that discussion again. So uh, 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 thanks a lot for this. I do agree that uh, causality might uh, uh, might be a bit strong, even though I do not think that the uh, uh, the current document is technological deterministic because the protocol is not solely understood as uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as as technological but as an assemblage but i'm very curious to see what the new editors will come up with uh, um, with the nature of the relationship thanks so much for the work thanks niels um yeah i would just pick it back on on a couple of those comments so i as well remember the ddos discussion because i um, disagreed with Molly's book. I mean, it's an interesting book. I think she poses a lot of interesting things, but I think to say that DDoS is a, is protected because it's association, I think is a stretch. And also within this context, I think it's important to remember what the mission of IETF is and what IRTF is, and to understand that it's important to have, um, a very solid base for using the internet and DDoS is like exposing vulnerabilities and like explaining them. And I think that's not the role here. Like if people want to still do that with like, you know, that's fine, but we're not going to sanction it necessarily. <laughs> um, the other one that kind it's of, real quick. yeah, yeah, sure. I think we weren't going to like sanction. It. It's more like using that as a way to discuss, you know, how limiting mm -hmm. the digital environment is before jumping into the case. So not endorsing it, but using it as yeah. sort of something, a discussion point that might help people understand where we're going. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I can see that. that. Or not even do it. But. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it would be actually useful to just go back to the list cool. to we'll do. 2016. Yeah, it's, um, it's in there for sure. Um, the other one that Niels mentioned is about um, the, uh, like keeping the app store and those out. I mean, one thing that occurred to me was it could be similar to like browser extensions, which is a little bit closer to IETF, but still not quite. That's one thing you could maybe consider. Um, yeah. And then just the last thing I'll say, and then I'll take a pause for, um, Juliana's comment, um, is just that I would really support inclusion of signal, especially because we have MLS. And so it can be a useful mm. case study 
in the spectrum of the case studies you have? Because many of them, like if we're talking about email, like, okay, there's maybe some changes to email, but it's mostly done and dusted. It's a historical view, but you can also then look at things that are in situ. Um, and that could be one awesome. that could be interesting for that reason. Juliana, go ahead. Uh, can you have the mic on? Yeah. Can the slide? The Which one? Slide. Uh, yes, about the, no, the RFC format. No, the next. This four, question four. four? Sorry. Yes. Um, about the question about uh, using RS, RFC format uh, to uh, both audience. I think it is really important to use RFC format and to learn how to write this format because we have more experience like talking about technology uh, without uh, completely understand how does it work to the um, public, no, to the broader audience. So it is necessary to, um, that's the same question I do to myself, uh, writing the feminist draft. Uh, and this is about like, uh, I'm not sure if I understood uh, Niels, but uh, the every question is like, we are talking about end users ever, I think, while we're talking about human rights, we are ever talking about uh, end users and here, sometimes people don't think they are talking to end users. So we need to find uh, the way to translate that in terms of uh, mm -hmm. protocols. So I think that's very important and that's what we have to explore and find the way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and I, my last comment, I think for now is just the, you mentioned um, business and human rights. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. I also wonder, I mean, if I'm recalling right, that is also considered in the, in 8280. So maybe it's worth also just trying to see what's been discussed before, because like, indeed, right? Like human rights is an obligation of states, not companies. But of course we think about, um, you know, best practice for companies and like encouraging them, all, you know, whatever. So I, I wonder if we can do our best to either not just maybe mirror what's already there, but even improve that language a bit because of your experience and your thoughts on that. That'd be great. Yeah. Hi. Um, yep. Leandro, uh, UPC or uh, also APC. Um, just a, a comment. Um, um, when, when we talk about um, um, the the right of uh, of uh, assembly or or um, or association. Uh, we mentioned this morning the case of email. Um, well, I mean, it's an example where it's of the few applications where you have local global access, global um, interoperability, federation across uh, small and large uh, email operators. But um, but sometimes it's not enough, and um, you need some kind of standardized governance, some kind of ways to. Uh, address the uh, problems that appear, not in a particular way for each provider, but, uh, but across providers. And, um, and um, well, or even imagine like the case of uh, instant messaging applications where uh, it used to be inter somehow inter interoperable, but the, uh, the uh, attitude of providers became like, uh, well, let's isolate users. So nowadays when you want to associate uh, with other people, you need to agree on which uh, application you're going to use to do that. So, um, I mean, it, it's I like very much the work that because um, the technical problems of uh, of uh, federated systems or globally uh, addressable systems translates into this uh, freedom of uh, association or or assembly. Awesome, man! Governance can't force people to participate in governance, can we? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, Thank looking you. forward to the list discussion yeah. about this. And this just and last question on, and maybe you said this in the beginning, I've just forgotten, but do you have like a kind of ETA when you'll send an to. email I and think then? we hope to. Stefan, I said within a month, Stefan said, that may be a little ambitious, but I think about a month is when we hope to come up with the next Dash 03. Cool. And then a, a, probably a set of things to the, to the mailing list that are going to be like, here are some things that are clearly not necessarily done yet that we want to, you know, notify for you and then point to things that we've done that you might want to interrogate yourselves. Mm -hmm. so, well, it'll be a 03, but it's not going to be done. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, I think yeah. it's been about a, a little, a month roughly.
Sounds good. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thanks a lot. All right, so I think Niels, you're presenting remotely on this one. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Hi, Mallory, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's quite loud, but it's good. Hi. Okay, I'll uh, uh, I'll try to put it down. I just dropped, of course, just at the moment I started presenting, but I'll keep it short. I got uh, three slides. So first slide, please. Uh, so this is the draft political. We've been talking about it uh, for a bit, but I think what just happened really illustrated very well what this draft aims to do, namely documenting some of the discussions that we've been ha having and that also keep on coming back. So it's also like creating a bit of a platform on the things we learned together so we can continue discussing them and learn from our past and progress at the same time. Next slide, please. Second slide. So what we're trying to do in draft political is document a long dist, uh, standing discussion in HRPC, uh, capture some of the observations and conclusions we've made, uh, document positions in the community, document the positions that have been discussed in the scientific literature on this topic and uh, provide a platform to, for, to further the discussion without continuously having to repeat it. So it's also like uh, documenting what we've been doing. What we're not trying to do is uh, uh, trying to discuss everything possible or this, uh, provide new guidelines or considerations because that's what we're doing in other documents. So what uh, uh, I've been doing in the last uh, two versions since uh, last meeting that I've presented, uh, integrated the uh, very generous uh, review by Michael Rogers, which was very extensive and came up with a lot of changes, as well as the great review uh, uh, by Julia Guerra. Thanks so much uh, for doing that, Julia. Um, and then at the conclusion of previous meeting, as many of you will remember, was try to do less and try to make it more concrete and try to stay away from anything speculative and try to make it as concrete and observable as possible. And that's what I try to do. So uh, I've done that by simplifying the research question, removing recommendations, uh, removing secondary or indirect arguments, for instance, about the IETF's financial position, about interoperability and uh, about layer competition. They, those were interesting arguments that in uh, uh, that were related to the uh, uh, to the research question, but not necessary to answer them. Uh, uh, so uh, I removed them. Uh, that also allowed me to create a new, shorter, clearer abstract. Remove definitions of protocols and standards because those were not needed. Uh, added methodology text to make it more tight, and uh, cleaned up many typos. So that's where we are with uh, zero three. I think the, what we have now seems uh, 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 is much tighter than what we had. And I'm very curious to hear from people uh, where they think uh, the document is at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Niels. Yeah, I'd also love to hear from folks about where they think um, this draft is at. Um, just. Could you talk a little bit about the recent discussion that we've had on the list, Niels? Because I think that came after this version um, and just wondering if you can go through um, if there are any of those any of those points in the discussion that you think you might actually take on board for another version or if you've been satisfied with the discussion, you're not going to make changes. I, I can see that going both ways, but just wondering your opinion on that. Well, I think that the discussion on the list came in response to a discussion uh, it came in response to a new version of this draft, but we're not about this draft. So whereas it was a, 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 an interesting discussion, only one remark was by uh, uh, was about a draft, which was from Andrew Sullivan. And he said that uh, he said there might be some uh, uh, internal consistency uh, um, issues with one uh, view that was portrayed. 
but that uh, 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 but we didn't try to judge the positions because these were positions that were observed on the list and during interviews and uh, and at meetings. So uh, uh, so I tried to answer that and I didn't hear back from Andrew on that. So so I think with that the discussion was uh, captured as uh, as far as possible. But I'm very happy to be told I'm wrong. Okay, no, that was really helpful to note. I also got a sense that the conversation was a bit all over the place and was not necessarily about um, the most current version. So it sounds like you don't anticipate any further changes based on the based on the list discussion. And there's no. no and, and I went through all that and I tried to. I, I I was very eager to make changes, but I did. I I didn't find anything. So 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 I'm very curious to hear from the room and others uh, what we can do to take this document further. Yeah, I agree. I'd like to hear that too. Um, okay, looks like Joe's going to the mic. Joe Hall, CDT. Um, I, I want to give it one last read, but I really like what you've done. Um, I don't have particularly good thoughts about what to do next other than working group last call. Um, others may feel differently. I would like to give it one quick review. I could do that this week. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, hello, Goshavud Grover, CIS. Uh, so just following up on uh, Andrew's comment on the mailing list, do you think it's in the scope of the draft to analyze the positions presented by uh, the IETF, IRTF community, or, uh, or do you think that's out of scope? Because in a way, the draft currently does do that uh, by, by lumping together, at least in four or five categories, the thoughts and coupling them with uh, literature on the topic. But uh, I, I think when when people answer the question, are net, like protocols political, they're, eithering, uh, they're either answering the question, are the processes political? Are the results political? But uh, I mean, this might be a difference in semantics here. That's a that's a really great uh, uh, question, Gershabat. I think there are uh, there are two parts. I think the what we try to do in uh, uh, the point uh, 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 in point four, technology and politics, a review of literature and community positions. We try to document as pure as possible the uh, positions that have been observed in the community uh, as they were. So, so we did not try to lump them together, but try to isolate groups within uh, that help one uh, uh, position and couple that with existing literature to uh, to um, to situate it into uh, uh, into a broader context. Um, I have been thinking about then trying to bring uh, uh, further in uh, conversation with each other, but that did not necessarily. Uh, uh, um, something very uh, 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 constructive because it, it, this is simply what we observed. And then what we then try to add in analysis in point five to see how does that break down into, uh, into practice when we look at standards. So um, I'm not sure how I could further analyze the uh, positions uh, uh, under in a more constructive way. And I'm a bit careful about the uh, the the, uh, the discussion, uh, but I would like to hear very much more about like the process versus the outcome or the output, because a protocol, of course, is a process in itself, right? And it's never a thing that's done because it's how it's used, and uh, 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 and it's a complex assemblage in itself. So I think it will be hard to uh, to pin it down in general. But I'm very happy to be here for suggestions. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Hoyland relaying from the Jabba. Uh, Avery Doria says it might be a good idea to get people to agree to do a thorough read through. I agree. I Go ahead, you're at the queue, and then I have a comment as well. Hi, Joseph Potman with X Algorithms Foundation. Um, so I have a question, but I'm not sure if I'm, it's going to be a completely naive question because I was doing two sessions right now. But um, uh, when I look at the draft, I don't see uh, 
explicit reference to 20, uh, 2119 and the uses of like the capitalized must and shall and things like that. And this would actually be a pretty interesting RFC to make use of those terms in that, in that formal way. Thanks for your question. Uh, Niels, while you're getting to the mic to answer that. Okay, here you are. Oh, uh, uh, that is not language that we can use in uh, a research group doc document because uh, we cannot make any normative statements. Or do you mean that we should reflect on the use of normative statements? Uh, really, I'm just talking about the def like 2119 provides formal definitions of words. Um, so it doesn't, anyway, it's a, long, it's, it's a longer thought in terms of the context, but it's really the formal meaning of the words. So can and shall and should and so forth. Um, when it really means that, uh, it just provides the formal definition of it versus an informal colloquial meaning. I'm not sure whether I get it, but of course, pull requests or, or suggestions on the list are always very welcome, and then we can consider how and where to include them. So just going back to the suggestion from Ari, which is a good one, that everyone has a thorough read. Um, I think it would be good if we can bound that in time. So since we also have association um, that's gonna be discussed in the next month as a commitment, if people can please go back to the list in the next month after reading it thoroughly and just even the slightest um, you know, sentence or, or encouragement would be helpful if you have done so as a final read. And then for those who are maybe engaging it with the, for, the, for the first time, or even, yeah, even people who've been watching this progress for a while, if you can try to answer the question, does this draft achieve what uh, we would like for it to achieve, which is to help um, establish the boundaries of the ongoing and pervasive discussion about whether or not uh, protocols are political. So does this draft do achieve that for you and your use cases and the discussions that you've had in this space? Um, is it going to be useful for you to reference this? And if you can think about that when you're reading it and then um, send your thoughts on that to the list, uh, that would be very helpful in moving this forward. Any thank other? you all. Yes, thank you so much, Niels. Thank you very much. Okay, Juliana, you're up next. Yes. Hey, good morning. Um, this is um, the draft on feminism and protocols. Um, we presented it in the last meeting, so next. Um, and it was a very preliminary version uh, where we were trying to uh, cover two different problems. One was on the user level, and uh, it was like taking uh, the feminist principles of the internet um, to uh, collect some cases and to relate it to protocols. And the other was uh, try to identify some manifestations of gender, um, of gender discrimination in the ITF archive. So just to say that that part was gone. So um, in the second, no, the first version, version one, next, um, we are like, um, like focusing on, uh, based on the 8280, um, which uh, uses uh, the human rights um, to understand how protocols can enable or restrict some specific uh, human rights, uh, this relation, so they use some specific concepts. And we're trying to uh, use that format to make it with feminist principles of the internet. Uh, we already presented what the feminist principles are, but you can find it in feministinternet.org. Um, so the difference is that in human rights, uh, this is pretended that everyone has guaranteed their uh, rights equally. 
But the feminist principles uh, changes that uh, question, um, understanding that not everybody has the same capacity to have their rights guaranteed. So, um, our framework is um, intersectionality, which is a concept used uh, from the um, black feminism uh, from the United States, but now used uh, in different uh, parts of the global south, mainly. Uh, so um, this framework uh, understands, try to understand how multiple forms of discrimination overlap, uh, is not focused on the problem of equality, but difference. And um, discrimination is not analyzed in terms of effective access of rights, but the conditions and the capacities to access that rights. Next. So we have three um, very important concepts. Uh, the first is the social locations, which are the multiple layered identities people lived, uh, which uh, are derived from social relations, histories, uh, structures of power, uh, where people can experience uh, both oppression and privilege. Uh, an example is me. Uh, in my country, I am ultra privileged, but here I am like uh, not exactly oppressed, but for example, uh, in my country, I speak English very well, but here I feel so bad because I don't speak English and it is very difficult for me to uh, express what I am thinking. Yes, I, uh, I have studied, as many people in my country cannot do, I have a superior grade of studying, yes, um, at a postgraduate, but here, uh, but I studied cultural studies. So here, this is very difficult to express myself because you are uh, mostly technicians. So um, that configures the way I can express myself here and I can uh, have a relation with you. Uh, in terms of power, I feel, I feel like very small uh, here. <laughs> so this is one point. Uh, the other are the different operations I, uh, one person can um, feel, which are determined by gender, race, uh, sexuality, age, studies, geographical locations, abilities, health conditions, and among others. And uh, this is all that other important concept, which is matrix of domination, uh, is the way in which powers uh, that produce and reproduce intersecting oppressions are organized. So in the draft, we uh, have this question. I think this is not uh, completed, but uh, can we understand the internet in the sense we work on internet here uh, as, a matrix of as a matrix of domination? Uh, and try to understand how oppressions are organ and powers are organized there. Uh, so this is where we are. Next. Uh, and uh, based on, this, on that question, uh, we are trying to make this table uh, principle by principle. Um, and based on the principle description, uh, first, uh, this is, they said, harm and the question is how uh, the oppression is being expressed in this principle, in each principle, and how can it be related to protocols. So we're based in 8280 and they talk about some specific terms like interoperability, centralization, content agnosticism, censorship resistance, and we're trying uh, first to understand those uh, concepts uh, related how uh, with how the oppressions are being expressed in the principles and so that's where we are where uh, and, and the next step is to uh, collect kind of use cases based on this uh, first uh, approach and yes that's where we are uh, it's a very difficult uh, issue <laughs> and um, Okay, that's ah, and and this is difficult because uh, it's different from the human rights uh, because it is it has like different uh, points. No, one is access, but uh, we have movements too. And for example, uh, in movements inside movements, we have governance, and this part of governance has uh, is related to how 
do we participate in these spaces? Um, that's why I think we were trying to understand um, something which is, I think, out of scope in this uh, version of the draft. It's more related with, for example, RFC uh, 7704. Uh, but okay, this is a work in progress. We're trying to address it better. And next step, I think. Uh, we're developing a methodology uh, which uh, tries to be more collaborative and participative. Uh, we presented this draft in the last IFF in Valencia. Uh, and the problem was that we were with uh, women working uh, on infrastructure, but almost everybody didn't know about IETF and what is it about. So it was like Mallory and I uh, presenting and everybody saying like, oh, whoa, interesting, mm -hmm. nothing to say. So the next uh, place where we were, uh, we are going to share it is in the Citizen Lab Summer Institute. And there we are going to make a more practice uh, workshop, more practical workshop, uh, trying to um, mix the feminist principles with some uh, protocols, texts, and to see what can we do with this based on the concepts we presented or are present in 80 to 80. And so uh, we hope to find some cases <laughs> and to script it better here. And yes, that's all. <laughs> Something to say, please. Thank you, Juliana. Yeah, I'll just add too that in addition to sort of in-person presentations and discussions with feminist um, you know, movements and organizations, um, we've also got some mailing lists where we could, where we've kind of been thinking about, you know, how to present this to get some online discussion as well. Um, We've had people opportunistically reach out to us that are meeting face to face at tech and social justice events that have come across this and reached out to us with their thoughts. So yeah, I think it's actually part of it's very you know, it's a very feminist thing to both be writing something down and doing research, but also organizing and building participation and buy in from the feminist movement. Like we're trying to do both at the same time. And so here, what matters is what is presented in text, but there's like a whole lot of other organizing and discussing and referencing and, you know, daydreaming actually that happens um, that's not visible as much here that is just as important for something like this to have an impact. Thank you. Any other comments? People have questions, words of encouragement. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tim Costello from the Europe side of the channel, <laughs> where we've just got a new prime minister. There we are. Um, Congratulations. I, I would, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I would um, uh, encourage you, don't worry about feeling small. I feel very small in this, surrounded by technical people, and I'm moderately technical. But uh, we all have our environments where we uh, experience we, we are privileged or power and others where we don't. I'm still searching for one where I can feel moderately powerful in it. But anyway, so I encourage you not, not to worry about that. But in the form of use cases, I'd also encourage you maybe look at um, asylum and refugee cases there. Where it's um, that there, there would be a place to look for this. Yes. Um, first, um, are you talking about refugees cases? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes. it is. Uh, the question about uh, intersectionality is um, trying to um, uh, conceive those cases too. Uh, but we're based on the feminist principles of the internet, which has like a sexual and gender lens to understand these problems. But of course, um, we have to, uh, our question is about discrimination and uh, marginalized groups. So this is not the same to be like uh, man refugees, like um, political for political prosecution, or to be, I don't know, um, a person who's escaping from war and has no um, economic resources and gets to another country. And it's not the same to be women 
to woman or something. And uh, so, yes, that's the question in back. Well, uh, yes, I would. I sorry, I would take it further than just the 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 simple or the the first stage of crossing the border as a refugee crossing an international border rather than a domestic border. Um, but the once you cross there and you you register as asylum seeker, then within the asylum seeker side of it, you may take many years until you are granted asylum or something. But within that that area, I think there are many use cases you could pick up where um, uh, there's a there's a gender bias towards who is who is spoken to, who is in in control, and and the power within within uh, within Sorry, that. I can I think I don't understand a lot. So if you can answer that. No, I mean I think you're right to bring it into like there's an intersectional purview. So it doesn't even necessarily need to be all about gender, but it could be within the intersectional approach to looking at power dynamics. My the only thing I'm struggling with to understand your case is how this might be impacted by the internet or specifically protocols. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to get back in the queue, we can continue the discussion. I think it would be interesting to understand your point. Um, Niels, you're up, and then Jonathan. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for the authors for uh, uh, for bringing this work forward. And I think it's really good because it's really opening up a new discussion in, um, in a field where one would not expect. So that's always very exciting. And I think it really helps us push the boundaries and think further and also think further, uh, uh, further about power. And that's also what my question is about. So how are you going to uh, operationalize um, how power is uh, is understood and then especially what I'm interested in and, and that's maybe also a part that we removed from a draft political so it might be interesting to add it here or to to, to consider it and that's uh, economy because uh, oftentimes in capitalist society power is uh, 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 is produced uh, through capital, social or uh, uh, economic or otherwise. So there's at the same time going on uh, uh, the, the development of the draft on uh, internet consolidation and the internet architecture, which is an IAB document. And I was, I was, I was, I, I'm very curious how to intersectionally take that into account and what could be uh, counter examples if one would take uh, feminist principles into account, how that could lead to other architectures uh, uh, and other principles. But maybe I'm asking too much, but I'm really curious what that would look like. Thank you. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, yes, I think there is a problem uh, when we are talking about intersectionality and to understand more in terms of equity than equality. Because um, one easy answer can be like, okay, let's design some different uh, protocols to um, better attend the vulnerable groups, yes? And uh, the, this is a capitalist solution, which is mainly or used a lot. Um, but I think we have to be like um, very careful uh, about how to talk about it and I, I've learned and uh, here uh, participating in the list is that we have to uh, try to address some very little and specific problems and I think uh, with the feminist principles this is difficult but uh, we have to let many problems uh, out of the scope so I don't know how to solve that but that's, that is what we're trying now. But for example, the draft of participation, Nils, I think it's good to <laughs> do that in other space. Mm -hmm. Nils, was it, yeah. were you going yeah. to yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much for that, Juliana. But you really made me excited about, an, about a new paragraph about equity, equality, labor, and knowledge. But uh, but but it might be place for another draft. But I think it will be really exciting to uh, to touch upon those 
whether in this draft or another one. So I'll, I'll definitely put it on my uh, on my think about it list a bit more. But uh, yeah, fascinating. Thanks so much for the work. Yeah, I did. I do think those those things fit into this. If you read the feminist principles of the internet, there's a whole section on economy, and there's several sub points. And this is one of the things that excites me about doing this draft um, is that you know human rights are not they don't confront power and economy the same way. Um, so that's what this framework will allow us to do, which is quite exciting. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Hoyland. Um, one one thing that I'm curious as to whether it really fits in here is privacy in as much as it is very difficult to discriminate against somebody if you do not know their categorization. So if you don't know that somebody is an ethnic minority, a woman, LGBT, then it, you can't discriminate because on a sort of very literalist sense, you can't discriminate, you can't distinguish between. And so is there a space here for saying, actually privacy is probably the, the most literal way to reduce discrimination on the internet? Yes, um, I think the feminist principles are more focused on the question about um, femini no, not feminist, women and queer people autonomy more than how can be uh, protected. Uh, so this is a very different question uh, because as you know, we have a very big gender gap, digital gender gap, uh, mm. from the use to the production and blah. So the problem is not, okay, you discriminate and uh, to recognize or better recognize the differences. Uh, and it can be named like uh, positive discrimination, but the issue here is other. And it, this is more like, how can we, uh, make our own choices about what we want to do. How can we, of course, it's the same question, I think it was in political, like can the internet make this, the society better or the society just will be better or the internet will be better only if the society gets better. And this is, uh, I think it's not necessary to discuss it here, but um, the problem here is more than more about autonomy than specifically privacy and privacy is one of the chapters of the feminist principles so i don't have an answer but of course uh we think we're trying to look at other side than mm. this question of privacy just to add to that i mean just another way of saying exactly what you've said juliana is that traditionally in like like in the theory of, of intersectional feminism, um, it's it's fine to be able to pass if you're you know a LGBTQ person or hide or to avoid discrimination. But part of the point is to not do that because that's part of the layers of oppression. So I don't know that it's exactly the same because I think on the internet we are looking at protecting everyone's privacy. But when you're expressing feminism as like a desire for the world that you want, hiding and not being yourself is not one of those things. So you turn it into a positive expression of, you know, autonomy, which is maybe another way of looking at, at privacy, but um, is a positive expression of that rather than like, if I just weren't who I am, then I wouldn't face these issues, right? Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Sophie. So thank you so much for um, this, uh, the contribution, your work. Uh, I think this is uh, tremendous. And it's been, we've been uh, looking uh, for that for many years. Um, so thank you so much for bringing this to the table. Um, yeah, I think it's a uh, crucial work. So um, I guess I have two questions. Uh, my first question would be, um, how has this draft been received? in within this community so that would be the first question the second question would be um so i'm wondering if uh, you are investigating the question of you know feminist standards and protocol not just the impact of um you know uh standards and protocol um through feminist perspective um, because I think there's a there's also a, a difference there, and uh, I guess there are already quite a number of feminist uh, technologies or feminist 
tech infrastructures that are being built and that are in operations, whether there are feminist servers or more complex uh, feminist tech infrastructures that exist. And so we can probably learn from uh, them as well. I'm sure you're in touch with them because you've been at the IFF. Um, but uh, I think they might have a sense of what could be um, feminist uh, protocols and, and standards. There's also a zine that is uh, upcoming in uh, September um, on uh, how to install feminist servers, what are feminist servers, and what are the protocols and standards. So I'm happy to share that zine, which is in process uh, with you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, of course, I think um, that our dream is feminist protocols and standards, but this is ours, maybe. But here we are <clears throat> asking for uh, the impacts from a feminist perspective. But, um, yeah, so that's the question. And of course, we're trying to work together with women working on technology, using standards, uh, dealing with standards and protocols. So, uh, <clears throat> My experience in IFF was that uh, we need to find a way, as similar to a question uh, in the um, draft on association, uh, I think that's a big question to us <clears throat> because we have to find a way to bring this information about protocols to them because they say this, this is so boring, this is not my space, this is not my interest, I just want to have my own server to uh, serve our movement, yes? For example, in feminist uh, infrastructure. So uh, we think this is important to bring uh, their knowledge and to embed it in our draft. So yes, we're trying to work with them, but we're finding the codes to, to uh, we're like bridge. So uh, we're here, uh, we're trying to write in this format, the ID format, um, but we need to bring it there. So this is what we're doing now. And happy to hear about what happens in September. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, Anani Marquez from PEP Foundation. Uh, thanks for your work, first of all. Uh, and then two things. Uh, uh, I think the first one, which could help a lot of people here who probably don't see how this could fit into the ITF or RTF, is to collect cases, concrete cases, how uh, women or, or other marginalized groups are oppressed. I can imagine in a region with privacy, as you mentioned, or or um, or with censorship in social media or something like that. I think there instances are possible. And the second thing is, I think you should connect to uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis from Open Privacy. She wrote even a book on queer privacy, and she's based in Vancouver, Canada. So perhaps for um, one of the next IT, ITF sessions, which will be there. I, I think she, uh, she, she she's an expert in cryptography and uh, and and has also this correct uh, this right mindset, let's say, to I think uh, to think about in these areas here. So this could be uh, very beneficial. And she helped us in Switzerland to get rid of internet voting. That's <laughs> another story, but uh, I, I could also help with connecting. I think that could be beneficial to this work. Thank you. I think um, Vancouver could be a really cool moment. Um, and I would love, so this kind of bridges both. It's also, Sophie, your comment is, just makes me realize that we've so far been consulting like pretty widely and like holding workshops and people come, but I think we could probably do a lot more to reach out to the sister servers, what FIM servers list, like other things and ask people if they could give us their time and we can, you know, just have a conversation about, maybe even develop questions, but I would just love to have a conversation about this with them uh, both ways, right? Like, here's what we're trying to do. What are your reactions to some of that? And trying to collect a bit of it. That would be really fun too. <laughs> maybe we can do it in Mick Cooper. <laughs> yeah. I have a... Uh... I'm Stefan Kutzer. Um, two comments. Yeah. Uh, first, um, yeah, like I, I would like to come back like this idea of different audience because I wrote like this question uh, in my presentation this morning based on actually your experience because last week 
I met somebody who said, uh, oh, we talk about this draft feminist uh, uh, RFC. And I was a bit surprised about this. And I, I feel uh, like we have the impression, well, I had the impression that the work we do here was more to interact within uh, IETF, but actually it's a good tool also to sensibilize other people about the work of IETF. So I think it's really great that you're like bringing this RFC to groups that they don't know uh, anything about RFC and discuss this so they, they, they can think about like uh, what's the impact of this. Uh, the other thing, uh, it's just an idea, well, I have different ideas, but um, just to go to move from a feminist perspective on protocol to uh, feminist protocols, uh, there's the um, RFC uh, that Leandro is chairing, uh, I've chaired on uh, alternative network deployments where they analyze different, uh, like uh, different kind of community networks and the alternative network. It could be a good model actually to use to map like the different kind of feminist uh, feminist uh, initiative or feminist infrastructures in relation, yeah, feminist initiative in relation to technologies. So it might be a good step to, to, to go to uh, standards. Um, yeah, but I think it's really good to bring this. It's uh, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of the, like what you were alluding to, Sophie, as well, is that there are implementers out there implementers of, of IETF protocols because they're running infrastructure. They're just very small, right? And they're very, like they have their own worlds and they're important in that world, but by comparison to the folks that come here, they're very small. But I think it is I, that, so the process of engaging a dialogue with them could help us cite their work if they've done writing. It could help, you know, bring them into this space so they can contribute, like just bringing that closer, right? Um, trying to raise up the visibility that that is actually, that it, that exists. Feminist infrastructure, feminist internet infrastructure is a thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana. Um, I would just, to end that section and move on to the next one, which is you, Gershabad, um, just to say that um, one of the things that we are looking for with this is a bit more engagement. So, so far the reaction has not, has, has been fine in the sense that, but there's just not been much of one. So if people could really engage and help guide it, because it's very an in-situ draft, like it's not anywhere near complete, um, but that's a good thing. We're taking our time, we're trying to do it right, and we'd really appreciate feedback at any stage. So feel free to engage with that. Okay, that's the end. Um, so, Gershabad, you're going to talk about the guidelines draft, um, and then I don't know if there's anyone um, it remotely that's going to be presenting on reviews they've done, but it might just be you as well for that portion. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Hello again. Uh, Gershabad Grover, CIS. And uh, so, Niels and I are co-editing the guidelines for human rights protocol and architecture consideration. Niels is there, so uh, Niels, please feel free to jump in. <coughs> yes, <coughs> so this document updates RFC 8280, which has an entire section on human rights uh, considerations, like guidelines for human rights considerations. And uh, what we're doing with the current draft is updating those guidelines after experience from reviews and uh, it is practice based in that sense and we want it to be more useful for uh, people reviewing drafts from this perspective so uh, yes so the draft was updated in may uh, after the last meeting uh, address joe hall's reviews thank you very much um, lots of changes in language uh, very useful i think um, mostly to do with how we are talking about the internet itself. Firstly, we uh, changed that to more of a design language, like these are the goals we want to achieve rather than the internet behaves in this way, etc. cetera. Um, yes, and uh, one clarification to a guideline, which was that when, when we're talking about authentication, we shouldn't use it in a context to uh, like prevent heterogeneity support things like vendor lock-in or uh, digital rights management, as it's euphemistically called. Uh, and 
uh, addressed Avery's review. Thank you very much. Uh, and we sort of clarified the status of the document as well, that the guidelines are also being tested for validity and relevance. And lots of editorial changes. Uh, and one mistake, I uh, screwed up the metadata, so the second editor shows up as University of Amsterdam and not Niels. I'll fix that in the next version. And yeah, we added the update tag. So it, I mean, based on the discussion in the last meeting, that now this constitutes an update to RFC 8280. Yes. Uh, so in O2, we had also changed the title to reflect that since uh, the experience gained from reviews was that uh, we're not just using them for network protocols, but uh, for uh, so, for example, it was used in the review of uh, the architecture for software updates for IoT devices, which is not a, a traditional network protocol in that sense, but uh, a document in the IETF uh, nonetheless. And similarly, uh, it was used in the registration extensions group and then the IP wave group. So we want the guidelines to be as broad as the practice is, but uh, uh, we still need to go through the draft and uh, sort of broaden the scope of the guidelines that are re still restricted to network protocols. Uh, if you have any suggestions for that, like please feel free to suggest it here or on the list. And uh, we notice that there are still some guidelines which don't have an explanation with it, uh, as in uh, it, like it poses a question but offers no help for why that question is relevant. So uh, we're still filling those gaps, gaps up. And yes, uh, happy to do anything the research group would like. Please uh, feel free to step on the mic if you have any suggestions. Uh, is there another slide? Yes, and how you can help. Uh, so uh, when you are participating in IETF groups and you're reviewing a document, perhaps a useful thing to do would be so you recognize that they're like this particular technical choice might have an impact on human rights. Then you just email HRPC with that specific thing. And uh, I, mean, I mean, that's a way to avoid even reading this draft, by the way. Uh, the second thing is that if you're reviewing a draft and uh, you want to identify problems that may not have occurred to you naturally, then you might want to look at the questions in this draft and you may recognize some important aspects that you have might have missed yourself. And um, uh, uh, Mallory wrote an email to HRRT with the list which is closing down. Yes. Uh, um, essentially, if you gain such experience in IETF working groups, please email the HRPC RG so that we know uh, how these guidelines are being used and whether you find them useful. We're still evaluating the utility of this work. Niels. Hi all. I was um, uh, 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 reading a book and I have a question to you all. What do you think it's useful? It's the book called uh, uh, Value Sensitive Design, Shaping Technology with Moral in, uh, Imagination by Bacha Friedman and David Hendry. And there I found different ways in which people have thought and looked at and assessed the impact of uh, technology on values and their intertwinement. And I thought this could be interesting for draft guidelines, but the whole idea of draft guidelines, by like keeping them guidelines and not making them such a monster as uh, RFC 8280 is. So my question is, should that go in here? Should it go somewhere else? Or should I just keep on reading books and not put it in a document? Well, could you tell us a bit more about the different ways they've, like, do you want to give us the really high level stuff? If it's yeah, like... But very, very different, you know? No, so they looked at medical devices, at access to information, at engineering projects, at space, at, 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 a, at, at a lot of different ways to uh, 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 engineers, arch architects, and policy makers uh, analyze technology and how it worked and how it did not work well. And uh, uh, it's a bit higher scope than what we've been working on. And they've also been, uh, they got good literature, they got uh, uh, a good hist historical context. So it might be interesting to situate our work a, uh, a bit deeper. Maybe that's not 
the best way to do it in guidelines? I don't know. So it, it was just a thought and I just wanted to throw it up and hear what people thought. Before I started writing another big document. Mm -hmm. Joe's getting to the mic. Krishwar, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it will be like useful to at least uh, like have those initial thoughts. Yeah, a few of us in the room are familiar with that work. Um, I, I don't see why that would hurt at all. It's really good stuff. Um, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry I'm being so like blah, blah, vague, but I just wanted to make sure you had someone else responding to you on the mic. Uh, <laughs> through that work, um, if it's not too much trouble, um, plugging it in or, or at least sketching out how you might plug it in might help us see it better, but I, I don't think it'll be a problem. It sounds great. Cool. I try to make it to para summary and chuck it in and see where we are next next meeting. Thank you, Neil. Anybody feel free to come to the mic. I just wanted to make a couple of clarifying statements about the Human Rights Review Team list. So that will be closed down. We um, I'm announcing it officially now, but I also send an email to the list, and then Colin is going to close it. Um, and then yes, I had written to um, HRPC about that and suggested that people inform HRPC if they do a review uh, against the guidelines document or 8280. I'd just like to be clear about that to like just based on feedback that I've received more recently, um, it would not it would not be helpful. So please don't um, bring the HRPC list into the process of the review discussion. So like if you're sending a review to a working group list, don't CC HRPC. But once that discussion has run its course and you've learned something through the process of you know, throwing out your ideas, um, how they've been incorporated or not into then the next version of the draft document, et cetera, et cetera. Do a postmortem, do a debrief about that with HRPC because that will be what's helpful um, to learn from that process, not to be involved in the process. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, cool. And I will reiterate that on the list as well so everybody has clarity around that. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, cool, cool. And uh, one more thing about the draft. There was a recent discussion about the right to legal remedy on the list. Um, if uh, I am of the personal opinion that, so uh, in fact, this was brought up in a review one time, which was the registration extensions protocol uh, working group. and. But that was in a context where the right to legal remedy was enforced. I mean, in a context where it was used against the state. So you should have the right to legal remedy against the state. And I still think it's an exceptional case because most protocols don't directly deal with government or state bodies. But uh, if you have strong or weak opinions about this, please uh, feel free to step. About uh, in what form? if more text needs to be included about the right to legal remedy. Joe, are you stepping to the mic, Oli? Oh, <laughs> that was a lot of suspense. Okay, <laughs> thank amazing. you so much. Uh, okay, thank you. Then. Thank you so much, Krishan. Yeah. Did you about the reviews? Yeah. Yes, you want to go into that? Yes. So uh, af after the last meeting, there has uh, like no review experience been brought to the list. So uh, not much of a huge update on that. But uh, I I know from uh, talking to people that two are incoming. Don't want to spoil those though. So. Uh, does anyone, uh, is anyone using the guidelines? Has anyone written a human rights considerations section lately who wants to discuss their experience? There, uh, okay, there is a link which, so some authors of RFCs and drafts have started including a human rights consideration section. Sometimes it's not actually rooted in human rights, but uh, nonetheless, uh, if you are writing one, please let us know if the guidelines are useful. Yes. Agreed. That would be very useful to know. Okay. Yeah. 
doesn't sound like anybody's going to talk about the review, so cool. that's okay. And you're going to message us soon about about yours. Yeah. And okay. In the postmortem, and um, are you planning on? I mean, you said you alluded earlier to like you're going to make a change to the editorial mistake in the next version. Do you have an ETA for that, or you're going to wait until you get substantive comments to do another version? What's your plan? Yes. So in the next 45 days, there should be an update with more explanation to certain guidelines and mm -hmm. fixing more editorial stuff. Great. And yes. you and Niels, I mean, Niels, this question is also to you. You're going to be working on the sort of next steps that you outline, or you need to, do you need to call in some favors to help on certain sections or you, you got it. So uh, one thing is because I like, I, I, I have repeated this call for the second time, which is that if you are writing a human rights consideration section, but from the ones I've noticed, I think we'll just get in touch with them personally. I think that's the better route. Okay. Yeah. So those three, four items are on our to-do list. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so yeah, we are ending early. So amazing timekeeping, everyone. Um, but there's also opportunity for other things if you'd like to raise them. Any, any other business? Um, no. Melinda, if you'd like to say something, Carl, and I don't know, whatever, <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, I don't think that there, I, I, I plan to say something about the uh, reviews. Um, I think there's no other housekeeping. Aubrey, you're also on the line. So if you want to step up to the mic um, in Meet Echo, please do. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks to the presenters and to the authors, editors, reviewers. Thank you all. Um, we'll see you next time in Singapore and on the list. Um, please sign in to the Blue Sheets if you haven't done that yet. I appreciate that. And there's there should be another one somewhere. If you could bring that up to the front. Never mind. It's right there. Thanks, everyone.